All right, welcome back everyone for our second session on church and ministry administration. Uh, any questions, any thoughts that came during the break that you want to ask? Any questions from online students? Any, any thought that came up? All right, let's continue from where we paused. Go ahead and share the notes here. All right, so what do we want to achieve through good administration, right? And uh, I just put this little diagram here to help us, um, you know, just to uh, talk, to, talk to us a little bit about administration. From now onwards, I'm going to use the word administration. But remember, in this word of administration, there could be the involvement of leadership, management, and the administration as it itself. So we're kind of putting it all together from this point on. So um, from our from uh, 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 from a leadership perspective, we want to develop people. So part of our uh, part of good administration is we want to develop people. We want to build teams, and within the teams, we want people to be developed. Second, we also want to establish systems so that things would um, go well. Uh, you know, for various things, it should be running. It should happen over and over again. It should happen well. And while these systems are running, we want to fine tune the processes. You know, like within how it's, and I explained that, within how it's happening, is it happening well, quickly, efficiently, with low cost? And we want to allocate resources, money. You know, where is the money going? Uh, how much is being spent on what? Right. So overall, we're saying people, systems, processes, resources. We are looking at all of that. Right. So we want all this to be going well, so that we can ensure that uh, there is alignment to the ministry. That whatever is happening is aligned to the ministry, not going off in different directions. And we want things to be efficient, and we want to ensure there is productivity. Right? So, our people, for example, if somebody is working full time, uh, is their time being spent well? Are they producing what they should be producing if they're working full time? You know. So we are looking at productivity. We're looking at efficiency, and is it all aligned towards where the ministry is going to go? Which is the overall goals and the vision of the ministry. So the people, the organization should be aligned, efficient, productive in order to achieve the goals and the vision of the ministry. So that's what we are trying to achieve when we say we have good administration. So we are starting with the people, with the systems, the processes, the resources. Make sure it all come together. In, a, in an aligned way, in an efficient way, in a productive way, so that the goals and the vision of the ministry are achieved. Okay, so the little diagram helps us think through this, and uh, we we must you know we must understand that uh, productivity is important. You know, for example, Jesus said, "My Father is glorified if you bear much fruit." Okay? so Jesus wants us to bear much. Fruit. He wants us to be productive. He wants us to be fruitful, right? Uh, so it's not enough to just say, "Okay, I'm doing some work." The question we have to ask is, "Okay, what's coming out? You know, is it um, is it producing the results?" Right. So that is where we will have to look at numbers. That means, okay, you know, how many, how much, what is the amount being spent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we look at numbers. To measure productivity. Now, some people will say, "Oh, I, you know, we shouldn't be looking at numbers." Well, then, how else are you going to look at productivity? Right? What is being done? So, part of that, we will have to look at it. So, when we talk about administration, bottom of page seven, uh, we're talking about people skills. You know, how do you nurture people? How do you develop people? How do you motivate people? How do you care for people? Uh, we're talking about organizational skills. That means how would you put various things in place? And also execution skills. That means 
getting the ability to get things done. You know? So, which we look at time and money and other skills that are needed to get the work done. Okay, so overall, when we say administration, what are we trying to do? If you want to sum it up, we are trying to put the right people, establish the right systems, the right processes, bring in the right resources so that everybody, the whole organization working together will be able to achieve the goals and the vision of the ministry. So we want to, it's all directed towards carrying out uh, the, the work of the ministry. So uh, we move now to lesson number three. And uh, uh, so the, the first thing, a very important thing, is to form a legal entity. So when APC started in 2001, so we had our first service in the month of February 2001. We started with a few people. But one of the first things we did by the month of uh, April, uh, so by the month of April 2001, we formed a religious trust, as we formed a legal entity right, to uh, uh, for for ABC to be a trust. Okay? So how do you do it? You need a, a, a trust document, which has, uh, and I'll probably put out a sample sample on uh, on our, on the Google Classroom. Um, uh, so you need a have to have a document, which we call the Articles of Incorporation or the trust document, that says this is what is the name of the trust. Uh, these are the trustees. So we started with four trustees, um, and uh, these uh, they are responsible for the trust. And um, this is are the, these are the objectives of the trust. I mean, why you're forming the trust? So in our case, it was a church, uh, and the church will do all these activities. Right. So in the beginning, what we did was, and of course we got the help of a um, of a chartered accountant to form this document to write this document they they have templates so they will they already have this so uh, basically we put in all almost everything we can think of saying okay the trust must be able to run a bible college it must be able to hold seminars conferences do printing uh, media everything right so at that time we didn't have anything it's only two months into you know we're starting but we put everything into the trust because in the future this organization this legal entity should be allowed to do those those things right so you have to mention everything in the trust because this trust document becomes a legal document on what you can do and cannot do right so this document is very important the trust document right so you go to a chartered accountant and they'll they'll, they'll have this document and they'll help you register the trust with the government so from that moment on, once you have registered with the government, you are a legal entity. You have the right to operate in the country. Okay. So the problem uh, have, uh, the problem happens when people start a church or they start a ministry, but they don't form a legal entity. Then what happens? Somebody can come and say, how are you running this church? On what basis? You're collecting offering. What are you doing? You don't have the right, you know, because just you can call, give it a name. You can say Shalom Ministries or whatever. <laughs> you can give it a name, but until you register the legal entity, it's not recognized by the government. So you don't have a right, and that is where people can cause problems, yeah, no? because it is not registered. So they can cause problems. How are you doing these things? Why are you collecting money? Uh, you know, it's not a registered trust. So it's very important, this first thing. So even if it's a just a ministry, uh, you're going to collect offerings, you're going to go minister to people. 
Yes, you can do it free, like, I mean, without a trust, as an individual, as an individual. But the moment you have more than one person involved, you have better to be registered as a legal entity. So when every, anybody asks, yeah, this is a legal entity, and we are collecting funds to do the work of that trust. Okay. So this is very important. And then slowly we began. So in the beginning, in, in, in 2001, 2000, I think it was in 2002, uh, when we had a, our first staff. The first staff was actually, he wasn't staff on the church. He was working for the company. So in those days, I was also running a company, a uh, software company. So this person was run, working for the company, but he would give half of his time for the church. Right? So uh, he would take help with the administrative things, like to book the hall, pay the, you know, pay the vendors, all those things he will take care of. And we had a, sorry, from the beginning, after we registered the trust, we opened a bank account. So all the money will go into the bank account. So we had a part-time accountant. So one lady will come. Uh, we engaged an accounting firm, the same people we are working with today. From those days, we were working with them. So they would send one accountant. She would come once a week. Uh, those days, it was very easy. Maybe two hours, she'll sit, do all the accounting work, go away. Right? So we didn't have a full-time accountant. We only had part-time. One person come for two hours. Enter it into tally, uh, make sure all the deposit money is correct. Go away, right? So from beginning, right? Uh, we 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 were we we started like this in a very small way, and then I think only in maybe only if I re remember only in two thousand four. Sorry, so two thousand two we had a part time uh, person who would help with the administration, and we. Somewhere there, 2002 or 2003, we had a part-time children's church pastor. Right? So he would, it was not full-time, just uh, like you would help with children's church and uh, part-time. Right? And so I think from only 2004, after we were three years into this, we made a first full-time pastor, worship pastor, youth pastor joined us. You know, those days. Then 2005, I think Pastor Jay Kumar joined us. So slowly, you know, we started adding people, you know. Uh, and then Selena joined us 2008, like that, step by step. So slowly we started adding people, building the team. Right? But the first thing that we must do is to form a legal entity, this trust you have to register. Right? So let's talk about that, right, today. Um, why you know why must we have good church governance why do we need to have a trust first of all uh, we although we are doing ministry we also must be sub subject to civic authorities to government right we can't say hey i'm i'm doing ministry why you're coming no because you're you're in this country you have to follow the rules of the country you have to follow the laws right so we, even though we are doing ministry, we must obey the laws or the rules of the land. So from that perspective, you need to have a legal entity. You need to have good governance. Secondly, we must also be blameless in our conduct, how we conduct ourselves. Right? We don't want people to point a finger at us. Or they're collecting offering. We don't know where it is going. And I've had cases. You know, there are people who've come... Uh, to church, they share some of their experiences, the bad experiences they've had. Uh, for example, you know, one family came, they were sharing. They said they were attending a certain church where the pastor said, okay, we're taking up an offering. We are going to build off, or first, we're going to buy equipment for the church, take offering. Next, he said, we're going to build some building, he took offering. So they gave, very generously they gave. After some time, pastor bought a big car. Then they went to ask him. They said, Pastor, you said you're buying equipment for the church. You said you're going to uh, build a building. Where is that? Like, what is happening? He said, don't question me. Who are you to ask a question? That was the response. You have no right to question. 
So basically, he gave excuses like this, collected the money, but he used it for himself. Right? So after they saw these things, they felt very hurt. And because when they gave, they gave it for you know, something, whatever the pastor said. But they, and then when they asked, also don't ask. You have no right to ask. You know, so they were very hurt. Then they came, they came to ABC, they shared their experience. So these kinds of things happen. You know, and then people are find you know, people find fault in the ministry. But Paul said uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, you know, 3 and 4, he said, you know, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 3. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Uh, so he's saying, we, don't, we want to make sure that our ministry will not be blamed. So from the very beginning, from 2001, and one of the big areas that ministries get blamed is in the management of finances. You know, and this happens everywhere, all over the world. You know, um, churches, big churches, you find people misuse the money or something goes wrong and people blame them you know, about that. So money is a big area. But Paul says we want to do things so that we will not offend anybody and our ministry must not be blamed. So from the beginning, we've tried to be very careful with finances. And so we have been from day one, first year, every of our annual finances, our annual, sorry, the summary of our annual finance always published on our church website. So we said, okay, we will put it out, make it public, put on the website. Anybody wants, they can go see how much has come in, how much has been used, what is the balance with the church. They can see a summary. Of course, not all the details, but the summary, they can get it. And we also said any member, if they have any questions about the finances, they can ask us. We will answer. You know? From the beginning, we keep kept it like that. So we don't want the ministry to be blamed, especially in the area of finances. Right? And also, of course, we want to maintain a clear conscience. We also should be able to sleep at night. Right? That, yeah, I am doing my best. I am not doing anything wrong. Right? So these are some of the guiding principles. So we have to be submitted to government authority. Uh, we have to conduct ourselves in a proper way, in an honorable way, and uh, we must have a clear conscience. Let, let's turn to Second Corinthians eight. I think that's a great verse. Then Second Corinthians eight twenty one, Paul shares something very important. Second Corinthians eight and verse twenty one, and this has to do with money. So actually, in Second Corinthians eight twenty one, he's talking about money. So let's read that, please. Somebody could read it. Twenty one, mm -hmm. providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Hmm. So he's talking about money. And he's saying, we want to do it in a way that is not only right in God's eyes, but it also must be honorable in the sight of men. Even men. Because this is money, you're actually collecting people's money. Hey, So we're answerable not only to God, we're answerable also to People, because people are giving their money. No, we can't say, hey, this is God's money, don't ask me anything. <laughs> no, Paul says we have to be honorable in the sight of God and man. We are answerable. Okay? So, uh, even in church, we're very careful, you know, uh, hey, make sure everything is right. Because if somebody asks about how and what we're doing with money, we should be able to give them the answers. Where did this money go? We should be able to tell them. And we want it to be right. It shouldn't be misused. People should not point a finger and say, you misused the money. Right? So that is how we mean. Now, uh, I, 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 I mentioned to you how uh, at APC, we started in February. By April, that is within about three months, we form the legal entity, right? Now, uh, I'm not saying that is the ru like rule, but I would say as soon as possible, you must register your trust, as soon as possible. Some people may take six months, it's okay. Some people may take, maybe do it earlier, that's okay. 
you know, whatever time, the time, as long when you know for sure you're going to start a ministry, or you're going to have a church, or you're going to do an, have an organization, first thing, register the trust. Also, very important is find the right people. I remember, you know, uh, from early days, we started sending pastors out to form, start churches. And uh, this was, uh, uh, which year was this? One of our early years. We sent uh, Pastor Dilip Nanda, who's pastor in uh, Barampur. He was a young man then. He just, just joined us. He worked with us for in Bangalore for one or two years. And then he said, I want to go back to my own place and I want to start APC there. And we said, okay, you go. He's still a very young man. He had just finished college, uh, worked with us for two years, and then he felt, I want to go and start. So, okay, you go. But we gave him good ad like, advice, like be careful, you know, start, um, and then you form the trust, you know, at the right time. So he went there. And as soon as he went there, within a few months, somebody came. I, and I don't know how this person, this person came. And he became friends with uh, Pastor Dilip. And then he told, let us form the trust. You and me will become trusty. I will, he wants to be on the trust. So uh, Dilip called. He said, Pastor, this man has come. Uh, he's, you know, he's started being involved. And he says he wants to form the trust. He wants to be on the trust. I said, Dilip, don't do anything. You don't know this person. Uh, just come suddenly. And to be on the trust, you need people who you know, who will be aligned to the vision and who will not cause problems. Because if they are on the trust and they're causing problems, you can't do anything. So everything will be stuck. So I said, see, you don't know this person. And the fact that he has come to you in the beginning itself, he's saying he wants to be under trust, that itself is a big red flag. His intention here is not to serve. His intention is to control things. So I said, don't. Just say no. Don't do it now. Wait. And so he gave that. And sure enough, after a few months, that man left. Because when he saw that you know, he's not going to be on the trust and all, he just left. So that means... His heart was not really there to come and serve and help plant the church and all that. His aunt he wants to get control. Then once you're on the trust, then you, you will control everything, cause problems. You know? So uh, we have to be very careful who you have on the trust. right? Um, now, let me give some practical things. You know, why is it important to form a legal entity? It, first of all, gives us credibility that people know, OK, if they're coming to this church, it is actually a legal church, not simply some name on board and uh, people are running. No, this is a legal entity. It's actually there. And people would prefer to give in the name of the church, you know, give offering or your tithe or your check. You give it in the name of the church. Also, uh, you can open separate bank accounts. So this is another problem. Many pastors just make a mistake. They collect the money, offering, and they put the money into their personal account because they have not formed a trust. So the trust has no, there is no trust and there is no separate bank account. So where the money goes, it goes into their personal account. Then they use it from there. So you don't know what is church money, what is your money, personal money. Everything is going from there. And this is a problem with many churches. I'm talking about especially independent churches, uh, organizations, because they have not formed the legal entity. All the money is going into personal account. From personal account, pastor is using for everything. There is no separation. right? But when you form a legal entity, you can open a bank account in the name of the church. Offering goes there. From there, you can pay yourself a salary. You pay others a salary. You do what? But everything is separate. It is not mixed with your personal account. Okay, but this is an area that I've noticed uh, is a problem with many uh, ministries. They don't have a separate bank account, actually. And so 
uh, and then if they take uh, anything on lease it's all in their own name everything you buy land you buy it in their own name so big problem but you use church money but land is in your name you know so it is very it's a, it's it's not right okay? whatever is done with church money should be in the name of the church or the organization it should be separate not personal right and of course there is a, a benefit there is limited liability that means if something goes wrong in the church or in the ministry it will not affect your personal finances because you've kept it separate right and then you can also uh, enlist professional services and um, uh, there is tax exemption for example if you are registered as a religious trust and you get the right permission it's called 12a here in india then the money that you receive you don't pay tax on it as an uh, as a organ a religious organization so all that money can be used for the work of the ministry so that's a benefit uh, so and then uh, some non profits you can receive grants and so on um, now there are two kinds of organizations, uh, actually not two, maybe even more, that you can form. You can form a religious organization, you can form a non-government social organization, you can even form an educational organization. So this is bottom of page 8. And it's good to know the difference. Suppose you're going to have a church and you're going to do religious work. Then form a religious organization if you're going to do social work you form a society or a social or a non NGO social organization the, another problem I've seen is people form a social organization and then they do religious work a lot especially a lot of Christians they'll form a society or a social organization they'll start an orphanage they will start school they will start a home for you know different social work and inside that they will do religious work that becomes a problem government today will catch because hey you said you're doing a social work social work must be open to people everyone and Yes, you can, you know, you can have prayer and all that, but if you are starting to run a church under that social organization, you can get into problems. Uh, because as a social organization, non government government organization, you actually apply for some grants from government or other agencies, and you actually get um, tax exemption status. They call it ATG state status as a social organization. That means people who give money to your social organization they get tax benefit because they're giving it to a social organization that benefit is not available for religious organization i'm talking about india so you're running a social organization but under that you're doing religious well very dangerous some you know i'm not saying you can never pray you can of course you can have prayer you can have some songs and all but to do hard like run a church or run a bible college or a duke ministry you have to be careful government can hold so that is another area where many churches organizations get into trouble because they're actually doing something wrong then they say i'm being persecuted persecution no 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 you're doing something wrong <laughs> you're not being persecuted government is enforcing the rules huh? so must be very sure about that and you can start an educational organization you want to start a school things you can run separately that is fine or so for example apc has is registered religious organization we are running a bible college bible college is, is an education institution but it's a religious thing so we are running it all under apc apc it's a it's a religious it's a bible training it's not like a school um, that is giving education right now we can start a school, a Christian school, if you want. Uh, if you're running it under APC, then we say, okay, it's a Christian school, provide. You know. uh, or if you want to run a secular school, like a regular school, that has to be done separately. The two options are there. But uh, 
the contribution, so there's, there are benefits of running an educational institution. Uh, contributions are again tax exempt. You know, so running an educational institution. So uh, these things, uh, understanding what you want to do, uh, what are the rules, is very important. Okay, now I haven't covered all the rules, obviously, I don't know all the rules, but it's good to talk to the, a chartered accountant or a legal person who knows all the rules. They will tell you correctly, okay, depending on what work you want to do, this is the kind of organization you must have. Okay, so you have, we have options you can form. When to form a, a legal entity, you know, so you start your work, get your work going, uh, understand what are the best options for you for your mission are you going are you doing social work are you working in the slums or are you running a church are you doing bible translation you know, depending on your work you have to find form the right kind of organization have a core team that means two or three people who are going to be part of this uh, uh, organization get enough funds to get started get the help of a lawyer or a tax expert or accounting firm, somebody who knows this, and they will help you, you know, give you a, a, a trust deed or the laws, check it very carefully, and then you form a legal entity. You are with me so far? Okay, is it getting very technical? No, you're understanding, right? Okay, all right, those online, please feel free to ask questions, okay? And, uh, when you're selecting members, you must be very careful. Like I gave you an example earlier, find people who are aligned to the vision and mission. They must be, you know, aligned to this. Uh, they must be willing to serve, not just looking for a position. And people whom you have good relationship, whom you can trust, because that those people whose names you put in the trust, they are very important because either they can support you or they can cause problems. They'll become a headache. Right? So, you have to choose those people very carefully. Okay, um, and I know, like currently, I know, for example, one one uh, uh, person. Uh, she's a little lady now. She's running uh, a Christian ministry. Her own people, trustees, that like the you know, they are causing her problems. So for her, it is so much of a struggle. You know, uh, maybe when they, I don't know how, you know, how they select around that, but right now that's the situation. So for everything she has to push through, that her own team is becoming a hindrance. Yeah. Then that becomes such a problem to do the work. It's very difficult also. Yeah. So we have to be very careful whom we select to be a part of the organization. I will give you a sample uh, trust, uh, just an example. I put it up, uh, but um, it's best to talk to a lawyer in, when you're going to form your trust. Right? And uh, other things uh, is uh, once you form a trust, you have to follow the rules of the country. So, well, for example, some of the rules are you have to file your uh, tax documents. That means what was the money, all the money that came in, how it was spent. You have to file it with the government. You know, So all these things, the accounting firm will help you. An accountant will do it for you. So you don't have to know. I don't do this myself. right? I'm not sitting and doing this. It's the accounting people who do it. But we have to follow the rules. Every year, you have to file. So for example, there are some big Christian organizations. They don't file. Then the government catches them. Then they say we are being persecuted. No, you're not being persecuted. You didn't do your job. You did not make your annual filing. That's why government is coming and knocking and saying, hey, where are the files? We want to check all the records. But if every year you had filed, the government won't come and trouble you. Right? Because you didn't follow the rules. Government is coming, checking. Then we say, oh, they are persecuting. No. Right? So we have to follow the rules. Uh, do your annual filings with the government. Uh, you know, whatever records they want us to keep, we have to keep. How the money is managed, we have to manage. 
right? So we have to follow the rules. And these things will be help, you know, the accounting firm will help us uh, to take care of things. But uh, I'm just making mention of it here. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'll just, uh, okay, my advisory board. Okay, I'll just say this and then we will stop. Um, so we have what is called as trustees. That means these people are responsible for the trust. Their names are on the trust. So when we started, APC started, we had four people. What happened? Uh, two of them, they moved abroad. They moved to the US. They become US citizens and all that. So when uh, when they moved, that's uh, George and Joyce, they were very close friends to us. So that's how we started. Uh, but then I think, um, I forget the year. I forget the year now. Maybe in 2012 or 13 or something, they moved. They moved abroad. So it they're there, we are here, and uh, it's we can't function, you know. And so, with their permission, we said, "Okay, uh, can both of you resign, and we will add new people who are here to the trust." So you can make changes to the uh, trustees, the members. So they sent a letter saying they are resigning from the trust, and then that um, we added three people who are part of the church, so like Pastor Jay Kumar, uh, Bini, uh, and uh, Melki. So three people are part of the church. They've been a long time with the church. We added them to the trust. So now we have five people. Two of the original people have resigned because they are now abroad. Uh, so we have five. So these five are trustees. They are responsible for the trust. But they are not, they don't, the other trustees, they don't involve in the day-to-day -day things of the th trust. So the day-to-day -day things are run by our pastors. We manage it. Right. So now, of course, myself and Pastor Jay Kumar, we are trustees as well as pastors. So we are doing both. And so we are involved in the day-to-day -day things of the organization. The other three trustees, which is Amy, uh, Benny, and uh, Melki, they're not involved with the day-to-day -day things. They are there. We go to them when we need. In addition to that, we used to have an advisory board. And I said, I'll tell you why we, I'm saying used to. We changed it. Um, so we had a team of people. Uh, initially, we said, OK, there will be a board. So these are not, they're not on the trust. They're only advisors. So we selected people in eight different areas. And uh, we will go to them for advice when needed. But they are not, you know, they're not involved in the day-to-day -day things of the church. Some of them are actually from outside the church. They're not part of the church. So, example, of a legal person, a lawyer, he is not part of APC. We only go to him when we need legal advice. Um, we have somebody who's helped us with the, the land and is continuing to help us. He is not part of the church. He is outside the APC, but he has been journeying with us and since uh, uh, we started this process from 2018. He and his he has his team of uh, accountant and a lawyer and all that. So they are not part of church, but they are advisors for us. So they have been working with us from 2018 for the land, all the land matters. So right from you know, searching the land, uh, reviewing the documents, all the all those things, which we have no knowledge about. As pastors, we have no knowledge about. But they are the ones who are guiding us. So they are like advisors, right? So we have this. Uh, uh, so right now, uh, this advisory board, you know, we don't meet every time or, like, uh, you know, we don't sit down and have meetings and all that. We go to them whenever we need help, but they are there. They are qualified people in their um, in their area. So, like I said, legal, we go to somebody. Uh, land, we go to somebody, and we engage with them. We talk to them only as we need help. But they are our, like our advisors because they are experts in certain things which we don't have. Uh, 
much knowledge about right so um it is good to have people like this uh, as part you know you can call them advisors or advisory board or mentors or whatever you can you know i'm just we're just using the name advisors or advisory boards um it is good now these people are in no way legally involved with the trust um some of these people are actually outside of church but they are there to guide us with the information we need right so it's good to have those kinds of people but again these are people we trust means uh, th that we know they will give us good advice they will care for the organization and they will give us input from that perspective okay i will stop here any questions you want to ask about church governance and forming the trust and so on uh any questions okay let's see now there are some questions on the chat from jechen uh, a missionary organization that know of each mission had to give details of how many souls and ministry uh, uh fruitfulness ministry and dismiss based on number of people except with christ i was his right to do so because later i came to know the numbers were given just to keep the job safe when being questioned by the leaders so what are the other all right ways you have missionary serving god being fruitful in ministry okay that's a very good question um Dachin. so uh, so uh, uh, the question in the chat is you know like for missionaries and so on how do we manage them how do we monitor progress so the example is given here is uh, every missionary had to give a report how many souls were saved all those numbers and if they didn't meet those numbers they were dismissed and uh, and so sometimes these missionaries just make up those numbers right so um i will i will uh, maybe very briefly i will share this and maybe you know we can bring this question up again uh, in another class but the way we function for example apc we have outreach churches every outreach church gives a monthly report what was the offering they received how many people are attending uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so the report comes to us more from a for us to understand what is happening right now uh, and we are we have other meetings that happen with them to encourage them in the ministry to address their needs and so on so this is a struggle because uh, if you look at it from an organizational point we want to know hey, how long should we keep supporting them uh, if you're not seeing results right so that is an organizational question and we have shut down churches when we after some years some churches have gone on maybe eight years and then we shut it down when we did not see growth when we did not see fruit or we saw that this was not going to go anywhere right or so on so we've had to close it down right and 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 there are all those uh, these are difficult decisions but uh, there is that balance of uh we want to support and encourage people but at the same time we need to see fruit in the ministry so that's a balance there and uh, there is no hard and fast you know like you have to reach 50 people you have to reach 100 people that 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 number driven thing i don't think is right it's more of you know have we helped this person have we encouraged them have we given them the resources for them to do the ministry and still if you don't see the fruit then there is something wrong we try to analyze it we try to help them work through those things and even after all that there's no fruit then we have to make a difficult decision to close down the ministry so it's a very complex thing uh, uh, but to just do it purely on numbers that is wrong right because uh, you, you can't do this purely on numbers you have to look at the person who's doing the ministry you have to look at the challenges they are facing you have to look at where they are working what are the challenges they are facing locally so that's what we do as we work with all our churches and uh, sometimes we help them for a long period of time uh, through many ways and still if they don't succeed then we you know then maybe it's an issue of um, them not being committed or maybe they're being distracted or there are other issues and you know if i look at each one of them where we had to close i can you know identify the reasons you know but it it was in being involved with them then we arrived at that decision it was not purely based on 
you know numbers and i'll say so much and then there's there's a lot more involved there so but i hope this helps uh next question which will be a um, um can we do social service or activities like orphanages uh rehab centers under religious organization uh, the answer is yes so uh, under a religious organization you can start all this but uh, it'll be a work of a religious organization and you can do all these things so that uh, and you'll have the freedom in those places to actually do religious work which is you know run bible class teach the pe children scripture and so on so if a religious organization is starting these activities you can definitely bring bible in worship do everything uh, under that religious organization however the other one is not correct that is if you start a social organization and then you want to do you know solid religious work you could get into trouble yeah all right um yeah so a lot of what we've said is with respect to india so if there are students you know on the e learning who are watching this and you're from a different country uh, you need to find out what the rules are in your country and you know follow those rules okay so let's pause here we'll continue this i hope you don't find this course boring uh, but uh, it has a lot of practical things there's, there's a lot of practical things that go into running the ministry and we want to share that okay let's close in prayer right right father god we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time and opportunity you have given us together to study your word and to do your ministry so that it will bring honor to you and the people around, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We'll continue this next week. God bless.